Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. I'm very excited about my guest today, Janina Saibene from Argentina. Janina, or Jani, is well known in the R programming language community, whether that is as a community manager for R Open Sci or the co founder of Latin R. She's also very active in the software carpentries, where in fact she is the vice president since 2023. Jenny is very passionate about teaching computing and making it accessible to all, and that also means translating teaching material and resources for all those whose first language is not English. Having worked on localizing software applications and tutorials in my career before, I know from my own experience how hard this is. But, as Johnny explains in the following interview, the effort is necessary if we really want to make computing and programming accessible to all. Because when you have to learn how to program, having to learn a new language as well is just another barrier. And breaking down barriers is what it's all about. So here's Johnny. Hello, thank you, Peter, for inviting me to be here today. My name is Janina Bechini Saibene. I live in Argentina, in the province of La Pampa, in South America. And for 24 years, I was a researcher at the National Institute of Agricultural Technology. And in 2017, I started to be more involved with different R communities, the R language for programming. Mm-hmm. Uh, I start being part of our ladies, uh, then I become part of the carpentries, and now I'm the community manager of our open site, where we have a community of software developers to do science. So a lot of research software engineers mm. uh, around. We use R as a main language, and we have different kind of projects like peer review of software, a champions program, a platform for publishing packages, and one of the projects has to do with multilingual publishing and translation and localization of material. Um, that's quite amazing because the R community, R the programming language that is, fascinates me for a long time. <laughs> and it seems to be quite huge because we have R ladies, we have now R open sci. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of what R open sci is specifically and what it does? Our open sci born in 2011. It is a non-profit organization and the, the goal is to contribute and promote open science using open software, open data with the goal of reproducibility and replicability of what uh, scientists do with computing. It's something that brings together all the things that I love, like research and coding and software and the open movement and this idea to have better science for all, but also build it by all people. Coming from Latin America, that is kind of important to see yeah. ourselves as people who can also build the tools and the science we use, not only being users of the technology. Yeah, that is what mostly our open science and it's a very nice uh, community of people that are always uh, very eager to share what they know. Uh, they are not yes. selfish <laughs> with their knowledge <laughs> and with their materials and with the software, what they learn. So it's a very active community of people who love coding, love science. I love to talk about that. And you live in Argentina and of course there are a number of countries in Latin and Central America, which are non-English speaking. So how, how widespread, let's perhaps get a feel for how widespread R is used in this area. Well, I think the, the R language has a huge growth since 2014, uh, like yeah. 2015. And I really think that R Ladies has a lot to do with that growth. Our uh-huh. ladies is a community that we work with chapters in different cities. We are a kind of our user group with this specific characteristic that, that uh, organizing roles, uh, mentoring roles, speaker roles are reserved for women and other genders minority. That is, it, it is open to all, but the leading roles are for women and other genders minority. That is the difference. Because of our ladies in Latin America, we 
co-found some conference, for example, Latin R, which is a conference yeah. in Latin America about the use of R. I'm one of the person who co-found that conference. We have the sixth edition in October, last month. Then several others are user groups, more general, borns because of the conference, because of the Our Ladies chapters. We start to be really involved with a local look in the international movement. So that opened other doors like carpentries, like ReproHack, like mm. Mr. Software Engineer for the um, uh, Software Sustainable Institute. So we start to have contact and yeah. open that network of collaboration between organization, institution, universities. That is what the movement allow, not only to learn computational skill, but to increase your contact network and increase your mm -hmm. chance to get the information firsthand and timely, I will say. How many people are involved in the whole ARB OpenSci community? The ARB OpenSci community, for example, one of our main activity, which is the peer review of the packages, we already review more than 300 packages. Everything is done in a volunteer, reviewers, editors. So people send their package and we're looking for people who review. And the process is transparent, open, not adversarial. So the idea is not to reject the package, but help the author to increase the quality of the software. Yeah. And we are in that loop with reviewers suggesting and author discussing, applying this suggestion or explaining why not until the package is accepted and we made that package part of the R open size suite. So you have there more than 300 people because some package has more than one author and yeah. then we have people who are mentors of champions or art champions people who write blog posts for us people who deliver talk teach different skills people who are part of the staff of our open side so we are talking about 1000 people uh, around the world and some people are the ones who come to our community calls, for mm. examples, or at events. We have community calls that can bring 15 people, and we have community calls that have bring 200 people. So we have that, <laughs> that wide, different numbers of attendees. So I think that, yeah. yeah, it's a nice community. We are trying to be more present in Latin America, in Africa, and Asia. Because traditionally, we were more present in North America and Europe as our mm. open side. Now, that's a nice lead to the main conversation today that we were supposed to be having. But, but I mean, I'm quite fascinated because, I mean, it's obviously a huge community. But how important is it then that we have localized resources? We are all used, or we all assume, we know enough English to deal with computing, right? So, because a lot of the material that you see online is in English and very often only in English. But from your point of view, how essential is it to translate the resources? The thing is, when you have to use a tool or learn some skills in a language that is not your mother tongue, is going to be harder because you have a extra cognitive load on when you are learning. And to learn a second language is not an easy task. <laughs> no. <laughs> And it's not cheap either, I will say. Hmm. Because sometimes when we start this effort or translation and localization of material, some people say, hey, but you should try to people learn English because it's kind of the lingua franca in this moment of time that we <laughs> have to live um, for science, for coding, for different kind of things. So it is easy to say, but it's really hard to accomplish. Not everyone will have the chance to have the time and the mm. money to learn a second language. So when you try to have tools and science that, is more open and it is more accessible to different people, you need to think that language is one of the barrier. Language is one of the way that you can also download the barrier of entry. And here I also want to say that it's not 
only the effort to translate from English to other languages, but there is also really good uh, quality material in other languages that could be translated to English too. That is also a way to start to see that the other language that can be as important as English. But yes, most of the, I mean, for example, programming mm. languages, they're based on the English language. Most of the one that we use are Python, Julia. The sentences, mm. the functions, is, they're in English. When I code in R, yes. I code in English. And I, I dream with a world where we can have uh, English R, Spanish R, Italian R, or Python, if you want to. So I will <laughs> I have to code in my language, perhaps someday. I, I don't know. <laughs> but we can start with documentation and training material. So I'm a teacher mm. at several universities here in Argentina and in, in Uruguay. For my students, it is easy if the material is in Spanish. If the hmm. data set we use has to do with our countries, it has little sense for a student in Argentina to use the census data for the U.S., for example. It is more yeah. meaningful for them to use the census data for Argentina. So everything is going to be more meaningful as the analysis they can do. And we also don't need to explain so many send things to the data set because they already understand. Mm. They know what the name of the provinces in Argentina is, what each one of the variables are measuring or record. Uh, for data sets that don't come from our country, of our culture, of our weather, of our geography, we need also to explain that. So again, learning is harder because you have more cognitive load there. So for me, it's fundamental to have material in the native language of the people who need to use this tool and who need to learn how to use this tool. First of all, there is the entry barrier. So who can access computing? That's obviously a barrier, a higher barrier if you have to learn English. But also what you just said, and I haven't honestly thought about it in that sense that when you look at programming language, let's say a for loop, a for loop is an English expression, or while. And all these expressions that are meant to be literal programming, yes. right, rather than having binary coding or an assembly language, we actually use something that looks like a spoken language. Mm -hmm. But which one do we choose? We choose English. So it's actually quite interesting to see that you think, instead of a for loop, maybe we can do the equivalent of whatever it is in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, I think the technology is actually available. I mean, in mm. R, um, as a research, I helped to build some R packages for my institution that handle weather data and soil data. And mm -hmm. when we were developing the packages, we have this conversation of, okay, how we are going to build these packages? Because they, our users speak Spanish. And again, because not of all our users are scientists, but they are agronomic engineers or vets, veterinary medicals, people who are working with farmers, like provide them advice. They are no scientists, so they don't need English. What we are going to do with, with our package, how we are going to create. And we decide to use Spanish for everything, for the name of the functions and for the documentation. Mm. And in R, you can also have a different name for calling the same function. So, for example, for me, it was very funny to find out that the English for American and for British people, for example, color and color, that you can yes, write. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. For me, it was kind. But we have in R, you can write the function whatever you want to. And we'll hmm. do the same. So, if we can do that for different versions of English, we can do that for any languages. I can have that name in Spanish, but just for color, it's the same. <laughs> it is the same word. But okay, I mean, yeah. the technology is there. Yeah, then, then we have this discussion of, okay, if you have this code in Spanish, then the people who don't speak Spanish will not understand the code. But I will say we can translate. If the compiler can interpret that and generate the code, then we can also do the translation to English Python to Spanish Python or vice versa. Yeah, for the people who don't speak English, 
we have several layers of complexity on learning how to code because language has this important presence on programming, but it's not only the manual or the tutorial, it is the language per se. But then it opens up another question, which is that you have a program very much localized to Spanish-speaking people, but then somebody who speaks Russian or who speaks Chinese wants to use that program as well. So how then, how open is it then? So how can you go from one language to another? For now, all the efforts we did on localizing and translating material were volunteer efforts. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who want to help with the translation get together. We organize a process to do it. We usually use some of this automatic tool to do the first version of the translation. And we made that to review for human beings because Automatic mm. tools are good, but not good enough to, to have really quality material. And we usually systematize this process so other people can replicate that process. Mm -hmm. And especially the decision you have to make when you decide to translate. For example, Spanish is, uh, has gender mark for almost everything. And mm. we need to decide if something is masculine or is feminine, for example. I don't know, the pipe in art, yes. the pipe. It is feminine or it is masculine? <laughs> it is <laughs> la pipe or it is el pipe? Well, we uh -huh. had to make some kind of those decisions. We also, for example, in Spanish, decide to try to avoid using gender mark for using a yeah. more inclusive language and avoid a sexist language. Then you need to decide what words we are not going to translate because they are so well known that if you translate, mm. you are probably going to make more hard to people to understand. Uh, for example, pull request in the context of Git. Yeah. So we don't translate pull request, for example. We don't translate issue either because there are concepts that they are already very known and spread mm. as an English word. So, But that kind of decision is different for each language. That is the things that each community need to discuss and agree mm. and write down. So then when you do other kind of translation and localization, you can reuse those agreements and reuse the glossary you create so you don't do, you don't start this work from scratch. That is one aspect of how other languages can reuse yeah. the, the work that we do. And the other thing is to, I mean, for me, community is key on this until we have funding to pay for doing this work. Until now, we get some funding, but it's mostly community effort. And in Latin America, we have an amazing community and we person like me who teach, you can see the difference in your students' achievement when you have the material in Spanish, we localize examples, when you compare when you don't have that and you need to give them the things only in English. Even when you are going to try them to learn because they are going to need English at some points, you don't need to force them to learn the subject that you are teaching and learn English and learn to be students in online <laughs> settings and all these things all together. So you can do that in a progressive way. So I always going to try to help with localizations because I see that is useful. I have been working in localization myself in my past. So I was involved in a program which was meant to be translated into or localized, shall we say, into French, German, and Japanese. I know that it's a huge task actually to do, because as you quite rightly say, you have to make decisions of translating what you think it should be translated to and balance that against what is the practice of mm -hmm. this particular phrase on other systems in Spanish, say, mm -hmm. right? So you said pipe. Is pipe consistently used as la peep or el peep in other programs as well? So, so how do you make these decisions? Because I can imagine that this is uh, hugely complex because it's not just one phrase. It's probably a large number of them. Yes, it is 
what we has been doing in the Latin American community is to agree and discuss with the people that are involved in the translation. These efforts are mostly done on GitHub. So we use GitHub issues where we discuss this. And then when we agree, we add these two translation guidelines that we write and glossary that we maintain. And then we try to reuse that for new projects. And then when new things arise, we discuss again. Sometimes we discuss on the slacks where we also organize ourselves uh, to do this work. And sometimes when we can <laughs> agree on <laughs> what to do, we go to social media and we ask people. Mm. And at some points, the people who are leading this effort make the final decision. And that goes to our documentation on how to translate and localize material. So I would say that it mm -hmm. is a really interesting discussion, set the tones for the translations. It's also, you have to try to align these decisions with your values as a community. So for example, mm -hmm. for Spanish, the decision of try to use non-sexist language has to do with our value or being welcoming with different gender representations. So if you use the masculine as default, we are leaving out a lot of other people. That is a decision that has to do with your value as an organization, more than a linguistic decision, if you want. But it is very, very important too, because you are sending different messages when you make those decisions and when you write them down and you try to use that in different projects. The other thing is that you are not always going to translate in a literal way. You mm. can. Indeed. So yeah. you are going to generate a new text that will be faithful to the original one, but has a sense to the people who are the focus of the translation. So, for example, in yeah. one of the books <laughs> we translate, we have this lesson to teaching for loops, for example, mm -hmm. and the book used a thong uh, that is uh, uh, green bottles in the wall. So it start to count 10 green bottles in the wall and then is nine bottles in the wall. So that song doesn't exist in Spanish. But we have one similar, which is about frogs. So <laughs> we have <laughs> yeah. five little frogs that jumps to the water. So we use the Spanish song that can allow you to do this for loop that go from five frogs to non-frogs jumping. So that is another decision that you're going to say, okay, mm. I will use the same example. I will teach for loop with a song, but I will use a song that people from a region understand and know from their childhood. The other thing is sometimes training material, books, lesson, refer to other resources. So mm -hmm. we try to find a similar resource in Spanish when you have this reference. So that is another thing that can change. If we can find, we let the original one, whatever language it is, but we try to also find reference that are also in Spanish. That is kind of increase the reach of the localization and the, and the translation. And as I say, we also try to choose data sets for the examples, mm. or for the exercise that are meaningful for the people who will read. So, so not only translate the data set, we have been done that, but also to choose data that has to do with our local reality. When it comes to the process of translating, say, a teaching material, a website or online presentation of some kind, do you first extract all the words and let an automatic translate, like, shall we say, the translate tool of a very popular search engine in the world whose name <laughs> I'm not going to mention? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then sort of go through it and then say, okay, we need to correct this, we need to correct that, and we go back to our handbook? Or how do you do that? Well, for the R OpenSci projects, we create two R packages to help with the task. Uh, Miles Salmon, um, G developed what we call Babel Down and Babel Cuarto. So Babel 
because of the Tower of Babel and, <laughs> and languages. Okay. That is what the name. What we do is we mostly use Markdown as the format for our documentation mm -hmm. and books and websites and training material and the slides. This package takes the files uh, that we want to translate, remove all the symbols that has to do with Markdown, with the format, yeah. extract the text, send to the API of another <laughs> translator, <laughs> not the one that you were mentioned, another one, um, <laughs> who is better for at least for Spanish and Portuguese and some other languages. And the API return the translate text. We add again all the uh, markdown marks and symbols to give the format. Mm -hmm. And we create a pull request in GitHub where you can see the English and the Spanish of the Portuguese. You have the diff of two languages. All right, okay. So there, uh, their uh, humans, reviewers come and they, we have uh, one first review who goes through the text, fix everything that is not okay, check that the text comply with our rules, like the gender marks, like what things we should translate and what not, and some other things that we agree. And when that is ready, calls the second reviewer that goes through that one more time. And when that is ready, we merge that to the documentation. We also have this glossary that we can send to the API with it details like, please don't translate pull request. Just oh, okay. So you that. can exclude something straight yes, away. Yes, okay. exactly. So that is how it works. And we also organize the task in a GitHub project. So mm. we have what chapters of what materials still need the automatic translation, which one need a first review, which one need a second review, and which one need to be merged because already. So that way, when volunteer, when people want to contribute, they can go mm. to the GitHub project and see where we need help. And they can jump and say, okay, I will review this and be part of the teams that are doing this translation. I think the amazing thing is that it is voluntary work. I think people, listeners, hopefully, and I certainly can appreciate that it's a huge task and a complex task. So who's maintaining it? Because, I mean, there's the process of the actual translation, but then there's the problem of how do you keep it up to date? Yes, exactly. I always say that we have these two different stages. One is to achieve a first full translation of any material. And the mm. second is to maintain that translation after that we achieve this first stage, the first complete translation and localization. That is different according to the material. So some books are, okay, it is the book and it's not going to change until you have a second edition of the same book, for example. Yeah. But then you have guides like the ones we have at our open site that are living documents. So we are improving and updating these documents often. What we do now is, is when the original language has uh, changed, we let the responsible people know that we did that change. We are working mm -hmm. now for this package, Bubble Dome, to be able to recognize where the change happens. So when you made a change in English, for example, and mm -hmm. merge that change, automatically will create a pull request in Spanish, in Portuguese, and in the other language with a change, only with the diff of the change, so people can review and apply to their language. But we are working on that now, uh, Peter. We still okay. don't have that ready. Now it's kind of manual work because we tag on GitHub to the person who is in charge of maintain each language for letting them know that we changed this. So they go and do the and apply the change to their languages. But we hope that we can automate this pull request with the diff in each language when something change. It's going to be more easy for the maintainers to actually maintain up to date the language. And I've got two more questions. So the first one is when it comes to reviewing our packages, let's say that somebody creates a package using English and its description and inside the code and the documents. Would you ask them to translate it to other languages or is that kind of a voluntary thing? No, that is a voluntary thing. What we have 
is we now also review package in Spanish. So okay. you can send uh, your package to the peer review in English. But for example, if you have a package like the ones that I mentioned that we create everything in Spanish, you can request that the peer review is in Spanish. So everything is going to be in Spanish. The form to send the package, the issue that we create, and all the communication with the reviewers and the editor will be in Spanish too. We have already finished two in Spanish and we are reviewing two more of 300 that we have, but we hope that we can increase that number because people start to know that they can do that in, in their native language too. So do you see an increase in students then? So do you see an increase in people who take up things like R and computing because it's now available in Spanish? Well, for example, with our ladies, right now our ladies, that is this other community I'm part of, we are now more than 9,000 members, uh, 90,000 members. Yeah, 90,000. So yes, it's 19. huge. Yeah. Yeah, yes, exactly. A nine <laughs> and four zeros behind. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we have more than 200 chapters in more than 60 countries. That wasn't there in 2017 when I started. And Latin America has the same numbers of chapters and members than United States and Canada together. So, and that, mm. that number increased from 2017 until now. So oh, I would right. say, yes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yes. Because we speak in Spanish, we teach in Spanish, we translate really important book like uh, R for Data Science to Spanish. We translate the package Datos, data package. We have mm. a lot of data that are using in this book for teaching. We create new material in Spanish. We create this conference that is in Spanish, Portuguese, and English. We change some huge conference, like, for example, user now yeah. uh, take talks in Spanish and in French. Posit Conf, uh, or our studio, which was our studio conf, I was the first person who delivered a talk in another language than English, and I delivered it in Spanish. So you start to change the ecosystem. And yeah. that's why people feel welcome. People see me giving a talk in Spanish, say, hey, I can send a proposal next year because I can do it in Spanish like Shani did. So and they did. Yes, we have a lot of people at user that send their proposal in Spanish and French and also in English. And we have workshop not only in English, but also in Spanish and other languages. I think that the reason because increase is because you can participate. Well, that's been a fascinating interview. Thank you so much, Jani. So thank, thank you, you so much. No, <laughs> thank you so much uh, to you for giving me the this space to share this. That as mm. you can see, is a passion of mine, and I hope more people wants to participate and be part of this localization and translation effort. Well, I hope so too, and maybe one day we get a code for thought episode in Spanish. Oh. Time's up. See you next time. But before I forget, this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons license. See ya.